following presentation is for educational purposes only. All of the symbols, trading ideas, and live trading are for demonstrational purposes and are not recommendations or trading advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. All of the information and opinions expressed by third-party guests are their own and are not necessarily those of Ninja Trader LLC. Trading futures involve substantial risk and may not be suitable for everyone, and trading futures can result in losses greater than the initial required margin. Traders should only trade features with risk capital. Risk capital is money that you can afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial security or current lifestyle. You can find additional disclosure information on the Ninja Trader website. All right, folks, let's talk futures. We have one of my favorite guests joining me right now, Jimmy Iorio from Futures Path Podcast, TJM Institutional Services. Proud Illini is written on your Twitter feed. Yeah, I'm particularly proud now. It's a good basketball team we got, would you say? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll root for you. I'm rooting for you, um, for sure. Uh, we have some visitors here from um, from some spring breakers, high school people here in my house. Uh, they're seniors in high school. One of them is going to, to Madison, right, University of Wisconsin. The other one's going down to Champaign. So we have uh, so we have a little bit of a, a Big Ten uh, uh, conflict right here in my house. I, I've never been able to actively root against Madison. I like Wisconsin. I think I loved Bo Ryan as a coach. I think they had a pretty good program. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. For sure. Exciting times, man. Well, I, I'm going to root for you. I'm going to root for the Illini in this one. Yes, thank you, Jim. We need you. Oh, my goodness. So what's going on? How have you been? I've been good. Yeah, I've been. Uh, the markets have been fun. I've been busy uh, and uh, everything has been great. Um, I like the fact that winter is ending here. Chicago, as you know is miserable until like mid-March and then all of a sudden it gets less miserable and then by June it's fabulous so it's we have to deal with this every year and now we're there yeah no I know I hear you and we have some seasonal stuff happening in some of these markets I think coming in April and May you know people might be liquidating some of their portfolio to pay Uncle Sam in a couple of weeks I believe that's the case. I, I, I think that we see some of that in the season, I mean, seasonality in crude oil. I mean, we're already starting to look, I think, at the driving season too. And I know we weren't particularly talking about it, but I think it's a, it's an absolutely fascinating time. One week ago today, when Jerome Powell looked us all in the eye and said, yeah, our estimates for GDP are going up. Our estimates for PC inflation are going up. And oh yeah, we're still planning on easing three times. Now, I think this was about as crystal clear a signal for dollar hedges like Bitcoin and gold to rally. And then we saw some less traditional dollar hedges like crude oil and copper also get a pretty good kick out of it as well. So I think what the market is telling us, and this is the key takeaway, is that before it was they thought 2% inflation was the goal. Now it's something that's significantly higher than that, or else they wouldn't have said those things. So to me, it's got to be like a 2.8, 3% is what they're going to accept inflation as in the near term. And that's what the market's telling us too, I think. So, all right, two things. One, why in the world are they is, are they releasing PCE on Good Friday? That makes zero sense to me. And like the fact that like we've all known for several years that PCE was supposedly the Fed's preferred inflation measure. And still on the Bloomberg terminal, you know how they rate the importance of numbers, they give it like five bars. It still has like one bar. Like why Bloomberg people update it. PCE is important. It's not quite as important as CPI, in my opinion, but it actually should be. And I the, the fact that they're releasing on them. Good Friday is like somebody's asleep at the switch. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, I was talking to Blue Putnam. Was it yesterday? Um, and he, you know, he's a big PC and a PC core fan also. And we get that uh, personal outlay just number where, where it contains last month's print, mm -hmm. which uh, you know it just boggles my mind. What you know? And this is the one. Uh, this is the one holiday, Jimmy. That um, the CME's closed all day. There's not even that morning session. I don't believe. Yeah. Right. There used to be, uh, because if it's unemployment, then the CME would be open until 10 a.m. But since it's not unemployment, then it's because Easter is so early, they're just closed. And we, we close the pits tomorrow at noon as well. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay, so now we have, um, so you're you're thinking neutral rates 2.8 going forward. That's what I think the, their inflation target is, 2.8. And I think he still thinks he's above the neutral rate where rates are not. But here's where I think the big wild card in the whole thing is, is I believe in the back of his mind, he thinks there's the potential for some level of banking crisis that's correlated with commercial real estate and a wave of debt that's coming due uh, within the next three or four months. 
And I think he thinks there could be some uh, potential potholes on the horizon. And that's why I think he's speaking inexplicably more dovish or else. And I don't love going to the other explanation. And the other explanation is that it's more political. And again, I, you know, I'm, I'm a reasonable guy. Jay Powell seems like a reasonable guy. If the incoming president, if the, the potentially incoming president the former has yelled out, oh, yeah, I'm firing that guy on day one. I think it's pretty understandable that he might want to not have him become president. That being said, I, I think Jay Powell is above being too political, but I think there is some uh, motivation there. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, we may have talked about this before. I've spent numerous hours trying to see if there's a correlation between Fed funds target rate and um, and, and the president in and, and the election year. And I can't find a, a clear and present uh, you know, trend there. So I, I'm, I, you know, I think, I think they're going to, they're going to stick to the, the script. Yeah. And I'd rather believe that it's not predict and that it's not that political. So let's go with that. Either way, he does appear to be a little more dovish. And again, an argument that I've been making recently is that it's an oversimplification to say that markets like lower rates and markets hate high rates. What markets really like is rates at a level where they believe in, intuitively and fundamentally they should be they should be higher than that. You know what I mean? Rates below where the market thinks they should be. Because in terms, you can make an argument that you know, go lower rates, if, if things are falling apart, we've re- brought rates to zero and the stock market still has corrected 30% several times in our lifetime. Um, so, so I think the markets right now are convinced that he's going to lower rates and that he shouldn't lower rates. And that's why I think the S and P's. I like I like the stocks too in the medium term. Yeah, and there's this thing called the Taylor Rule. I don't know if you've studied that, but it's you know we're supposed to Fed funds is supposed to be one point one point five percent above the inflation rate, whatever, however you define what the inflation rate is, which means we're a little bit higher than we should be according to that rule. Right, and I I think that that's an interesting rule. Um, that's his name's John Taylor, right? But anyway, I think he's a smart guy, and I think that's interesting. And again, perhaps Powell's looking at that and saying, you know, maybe, maybe we could have a little bit lower rates. Again, by the way, like the, the whole notion that we have this good economy and this economic data is good. If you say that, if you're one of these economists who spit that out, but then don't mention the fact that we're racking up one trillion dollars of new national debt every hundred days, you're just you're being irresponsible because it definitely belongs in the discussion. Whether you view it as important or not, that's one thing. Spoiler, it is important. And that's probably why some of that data is is coming in hotter than expected. But the government spending is obfuscating what the real economic picture is. And the question becomes, how long can that continue? It's about 120% of GDP right now. Crazy, right? I mean, so, so you don't think it's unreasonable that I'm pointing that finger, correct? I don't. And again, I... I had the luxury of having Blue Putnam with me yesterday, and we talked about this a little bit. You know, Japan's at what two hundred and fifty percent, but then you know the it gets a little shady. The countries, you know, other than Japan, who seems to be doing okay. Um, Blue's point was, um, you know, as long as you're growing, and as and as long as um, inflation is under control, then that ratio is okay. We'll be able to pay, you know, his point of view, we'll be able to pay the debt. I mean, this is an like, emergency. I like Blue Button a lot, but I will say, and I think he's very, very right. And I will say since 1920, there's been 53 countries that have hit a debt to GDP of 130%, including, including us. 51 of the 53 yeah. have had some level of default. And that might've been defined as a wild inflationary period as well. But the only one who's managed to keep the plate spinning has been Japan. So, so yes, it's, it's what he's saying is that's an interesting time to look at Japan and say, yeah, things can go on for a little while longer, but there's been other places where it hasn't as well. So I think what the big, the big thing is going to be in about July, when that pool that's available liquidity for the treasury that's in the reverse repo market. And I know I don't, we don't want to go in too deep to that in here because we could do a whole show on what reverse repo is, but let's just say it's this cushion. It's this liquidity cushion that the treasury is tapping that runs to zero in about July. And then the Fed has to start auctioning bonds off the whole duration curve, and we'll see what the appetite is for that. And I have this belief, and it's like a 20% belief, that auctions will start to get sloppy right at about the same time the what I talked about, the commercial real estate banking problem happens. I think it'd be July or August, and that's when I think the Fed can be pushed off the sidelines. And they'll be pushed off the sidelines quickly to ease if those things start to happen in a negative way. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I didn't think of that. Yeah. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. 
Um, you know, and it tracks with the Fed funds tool a little bit. Right now we have a, a Fed funds tool at the CME group that's finally kind of in aligned with the dot plot, right? right. Kind, of, kind of similar now. Yes, finally, which is so funny how it was, um, you know, predicting like 170 basis points of easing at the same time. And by the way, I was pulled in by that, not to the 170 basis points, but I thought it would be substantial easing. But remember, when you look at that tool, that tool, there's a lot of risk managers at banks and hedge funds who come and tap someone on the shoulder and say, you have to hedge yourself against this potentially happening, eases. So that, if, if I see it saying 170 basis points are priced in, in my mind, that's like 130 basis points being priced in, the extra being just the need, the necessity to hedge against that eventuality. Okay, so the hedge tightens it up, basically. Yeah, right. And it, it makes it look more close than it is. Yeah. Yeah. Is how meaningful in your mind is the commitment of traders report for treasuries? I've never really looked at it that much. Do you think I should be looking at it more or no? You're a busy guy. I don't want to put more on your plate, but uh more indicators. And I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean everybody I think the consensus is track what the what the commercials are doing, what the hedgers are doing, because they tend to be smarter than everybody else. That does make sense to me. Yeah. yeah, but it's still it is delayed data. It's it's a good week delayed, so that's the that's the other problem with it. And again, I you know what a lot of my clients are trading, uh, you know, the SOFR options. So I, I I oftentimes see what the flows are. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one for sure. All right. So what do we? So equity markets. So equity is is, is killing it. Gold's crushing it. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is you know back over seventy thousand. You know, where should, where should we focus at here? You, I, when I was waiting in the green room, you had a gold chart up that I really liked and I'd like to go over too. And you guys, basically, I think you had similar um, viewpoints as me, but I'd like to give, throw my two cents into that if it's okay. So Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm going to pull up uh, a daily then. Is that good? Well, the one on the bottom, the bottom right corner oh. here. Of, this is a 10 minute. Okay. Is that so, well, that's a 10 minute. Is yeah, the, that's a, let's that's go a back 10 to minutes. Daily, because I think the daily has somewhat of a similar pattern, right? Let's pull it up. So here's the daily, right? So we, we just keep, and in my rectangles, Jimmy, I throw these up here for just to kind of identify support and resistance areas. That's all that is. Um, just to help me with a kind of a visual crutch of what's going on. But yeah, we, 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 we had a huge rally. We had sideways consolidation and now we broke out to the upside. By the way, I, I, I've been off the floor and off my computer for like an hour. Did this just happen where we blasted up to the upside like that? That's pretty yeah, amazing. Well, well, we, we, this today we blasted up, but then we retraced all the way back down and then we kind of rallied back up. Okay, good. Well, this just, this shows this, I am a full on bowl of gold. And you know, when you hear Bobby and I in our, our podcast, we talk about how both of us are kind of the same. We're 60 to 70% technical analysis and the other we use 30 to 40% fundamental to buttress. So if you need fundamental to buttress your gold opinion, just look at central banks around the world buying gold. Look at what we just said about the Federal Reserve saying, yes, we're essentially moving our target for inflation higher. But you didn't say that. I know that. I'm, I'm putting those words in his mouth and I'm doing so intentionally. And if you, that, that's all I need to know to like gold. Now I look at this technical pattern, the fact that we've broken it at two days above that consolidation area. All I need now is a trade above that wick from yesterday. And then I think it's time to buy more gold again. And by the way, when I heard, and I, I've said this so people don't Consider you. Know, I, I've said it right at the time. The second I heard Jerome Powell say those things, the first thing I did was buy gold because I thought, oh crap, things could really hit the fan here. So that's what I did, and I will buy more probably. All right. Well, this is looking like a powerful bullish trend right now. You know, trading above twenty two hundred for somebody who's been, you know, and this is, you know, again, this is nominal. This isn't real, but um, getting these nominal highs, um, trading above twenty two hundred is just kind of shocking for a guy like me. It was hard enough to get over 2,000. It took me 20 years. It took us 20 years to get over 2,000, despite the fact that there was that unseen inflation happening. So now we've broken through it. And as you as you know, and everybody who's watching this knows too, is that the fundamental story oftentimes changes when the technical story does, meaning that people kind of bend it and provide a story and just to give it, just to give it a backstory. I think the technical story here is what's what's pervasive. I think it's what's a big deal. And again, take out yesterday's highs, and I think it's off to the races. I don't think 2,300, even to 2,500 is unreasonable within the next six months. 
Yeah, and I'm going to take a little bit of a contrarian view. I, I have an RSI indicator at the bottom. I don't know if you follow that or not, but we've been overbought. You know, when we when we're overbought, we rally like crazy. And so I envision another another overbought segment right here coming up. Continuation rally. So what what would that propel it to in your mind? Or yeah, I don't have an ex, I don't have a target. I mean, it's it's funny you should ask that because it's it's open sky, right? Yeah. We're we're we're. Yeah. You know, I could do an I could do a, a fib extension, maybe. Um, really, what I do is I'd phone Mike Arnold and say, "Hey, Mike, hey, where, where are we? <laughs> where do we need to go here?" Uh, so I don't know, but it's, wow. it's it, uh, you know, look at the other thing that's that I thought was interesting. And I want to run this by you as well. Um, we had um, Larry Williams on the other day, and Larry was tell he was studying uh, Jesse Livermore. Remember that guy from the twenties and thirties you know, uh, arguably the greatest trader that ever lived kind of thing. I don't remember how his life ended too, but anyway, go on. I know it was tragic for sure. For sure. Um, and I, I'm not, all right. I have some opinions there. We're not, this is a family show. We won't talk about it, but um, he, his analysis was Larry's analysis on Livermore was um, he goes for the trend and he just keeps buying new highs. Right. So on my chart right here, when I think about that, um, you know, we have a new high here. Uh, we made a new high here at 2085, approximately the end of the month in February. Um, he would have got long, boom, rallied up, consolidation, made it a new high. He would have got long, right? He was accumulate. He was cost average dollaring up instead of how a lot of people do it badly on the downside, and that was one of his keys. So when I see this, I'm like, wow, maybe there's something to this buying highs, buying highs, buying highs when you have a really strong trend on the upside. And I, and I, my technical trading tends more toward that Jesse Livermore style. That's why I said, if it trades above yesterday's high, that's where I get in. And that's counterintuitive to a lot of people. Like I want to buy it, but I want to buy it higher than there, meaning the momentum has built and is beginning to push it. That's why I have that opinion. And that's what's worked for me in the past. Bingo. You see it. It's right there. I think that that, that means something, that wick. And maybe we'll wick through it today. Is that the way you, you guys are saying it now? Wick through it? Is that the, we're going to trademark that? We we started. To, we, uh, yeah, I know. I mean, cause, you know, we do a lot of analysis early in the morning on kind of tighter time frames because we're talking to day traders, right? Yeah. And so you do see a lot of this this wicking through behavior, especially in markets like the micro Nasdaq that are so volatile. Sometimes, even though right. they have huge volume, they bounce around a lot, like popcorn on the trading ladder. That's um. So we we had to we had to come up with something, Jimmy. I love, this it. I love it. I'm going to use it like I made it up. That's kind of what I do. You could you could do it. You could do that. That's awesome. All right. So we have gold. The other market that I, I'm a super fan of now and I wasn't, and you could you could take the opposite position. I'm I'm good with that, is the Bitcoin. I'm just gonna put BTC up right now, CME Group's big contract. You know, it looks kind of like gold, right? It's just railing, railing, railing off the chart. Yeah, and you know exactly what I, how I'm gonna play this one. <laughs> Anyway, because the, the the green candle from the three candles ago was the breakout of that down move. OK, um, these two candles are nothing but a consolidation in my mind. And as soon as it takes out, uh, I, I'm hoping that it closes today. Uh, it still has that shape of candle, whatever. If it goes above that high from from yesterday, again, off to the races. I, I, what Bitcoin? It's got, you know, the, first of all, it's got the Fed behind. The Fed just you said what they said. We've gone over that in tedium. It's got BlackRock, our Lord and Saviors, who are involved in it now, which validates the validates the coin. It has the halving coming up in April, which reduces the monetary benefit for mining Bitcoin by a half, theoretically making it more scarce and more valuable. It already had its 18% pullback, which it usually has before having. This is the fourth one. And again, I hate the fact when I start talking like I'm some sort of Bitcoin expert, I mostly trade it technical and I mostly trade it as a um, as a no confidence vote in fiat currency stewardship. That's what I believe Bitcoin is. And by the way, that's an easy sell to me because I think they are being irresponsible with stewardship of our currency. So I'm I'm long Bitcoin. It's so funny. I've been, I, I've never, I don't trade it so much as every week I buy it. I have for like six years. And it was a small amount. And now all of a sudden it's a big amount. So I actually have to start worrying about it now. And I'm not sure if I'm going to take profit or just start to use options along the way to hedge. But uh, I think Bitcoin's going higher. As soon as the CMA launched this product and, in, in, you know, the, the big size Bitcoin contract, my initial reaction was, oh, that sucks. We can't trade it. It's too big. But what it did was it opened the door for the hedgers. Right. And once hedging came and got involved, 
then we had a lot more activity in underlying, you know, the cash Bitcoin. No doubt about it. And now then the, the CME launched the micro Bitcoin and micro ether futures, which does open the door for different levels of depth of pockets to trade it. And again, yeah, I'm not, I'm not trading a contract that's five Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, the thing can move 15% in a day. That'd be a hard conversation with my wife. Yeah, we're not going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going on vacation this decade sorry <laughs> yeah oh my god all right so that thing's on the move and we got to talk about the e-mini s&p it's you know this is our kind of our our, our go-to our core our core marketplace right now I'll pull up a daily chart and again i have my rectangle so hopefully it doesn't clutter clutter the view a little bit but it seems to me and let me go back in time here and get your opinion I, we got plenty of time left on the clock so we, did you see the new countdown timer love it yeah yeah, so we can't go over. We'll get Kevin will be like all over us if we go over. Kevin's like the police of this. But well, he's got to run this thing behind the scenes. So I mean, we see it. This this is I can go back forever here on a daily chart, but you know, we get a rally, plateau, plateau, consolidation, rally, consolidation, rally, consolidation, rally, consolidation. And that pattern is just it's 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 inexorable. It's still going on. And so when I look at this chart, I see, all right, now we're gonna have a sideways behavior for a while. Yeah, and, and I, I believe that. The, the trend is your friend. It has developed this pattern that makes sense to me. I think it gets if it gets toward the high the higher end of that lower box that you drew, it's a time to accumulate. If it if it busts above that higher box, it's a time to accumulate too. Um, I, it, it to me, there's I, I, I make a case before I, in three or four months, I think that's going to have a significant. Uh, pullback, a quick pullback, an eight to ten percent pullback. I, I believe when the VIX is trading at twelve, meaning options are pretty dirt cheap, and the trend is so pronounced as it is, I'm staying long. Every time there's a good solid update, I increase my options protection on the downside, and, and I'm doing options for a big move. Like I'll sell a put to buy two or three puts underneath it, so I help to finance that trade. And because my belief is that if it starts like breaking through that box, breaking through the box below it it could start in the cascade. But the point is that is that bulls can make money, bears can make money, pigs get slaughtered. We've been saying that since we've been in this business. That means that just because you're staying long doesn't mean you don't put in protections, doesn't mean you don't trim some of your position. And if you start to get too greedy, that's when you're going to get punched right in the face. So I actually, I, I, I don't see any reason not to be long stocks. And it is part of that same trade of Bitcoin, gold, stocks. It's just I believe the Fed is going to be too easier than the market thinks it should be. And at least that's the talk right now. And that's fueling equity markets. So that's why I'm long. So do you think though, if the Fed cuts rates either at three to four times this year, that's actually going to be a negative drag on equity prices? I, I depends the depending on the reason. If if uh, economic data starts to trend lower at a reasonable pace and they do that to um, you know, to they do that to face that, or if what I'm saying is a possibility, remember, I did not say it was my baseline. I said the possibility of the bank of banking crisis happening and all of a sudden the stocks are heading because I think the Fed will, will ease really quickly and the stock market will ignore it potentially for weeks. The fact that rates are zero, it'll only be after some time where people kind of you know bring their head out of the foxhole and say, wait, rates are back down to 2%. Stock market has had a significant pullback. Then let's start getting into it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense for sure. Um, let me pull in real quick. We got time. We got time. Let me pull in. I'm going to pivot. I know we're kind of totally off. We're deviating from the script and then we don't really have one. But we're deviating. <laughs> so tenure notes. All right. Now, should I be looking at the alter notes or the tenure notes? So either one, I let's look at tenure because you know, two year, we know what two years is. Two years in a very, very sideways trend. So that you're doing two years, the the uh, big contract, I, yield contract, I'm, right? I'm doing the ZN, the 10-year note. The ZN. Okay, because I think, can you go a, a little more uh, more data too, like a daily? Yeah, 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 yeah. We could, I got a trend, I got an old trend line sitting there from right. yesteryear. Yeah. Oh, wow, see. we can go back. Let's see how far back we can go. I have, yeah, we can go back pretty far. <laughs> So here's first my fundamental thesis for why I think long end rates are going higher. And it is, I mentioned before, the 450 billion that's sitting in reverse repo that right now is attracting the treasury issuance to the short end, three month bills, uh, things like that is what have been the, the heaviest amount of issuance. 
when that runs out, that then they have to start selling further out the curve. Now, today is a seven-year auction that happens in a couple hours that I'm interested in because that's about the lowest duration that I'm starting to be worried about. But anyway, so I think there was a time, and I'm sure I said this to you, where I thought they're going to start selling 10 years, depress the price, push the yields up. And you know, again, where that box is in the downside is about, I think it's about 510 in yields. And uh, yeah. does that sound about right? Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I think that that is an easy place to hit within the next couple of months. And the store, what I used to think is that when they have to start selling bonds long end into sloppy auctions and sloppy demand, I thought the Fed would quickly jump in. As well. Now I'm not so sure of that. So I, I, I start to think that maybe the Fed wouldn't mind a reasonably steep yield curve and they'll allow 10 year rates to go a little higher. And then they'll at the same time be, be uh, reducing short end rates. And that's why I am long steeper. I think 5% within the next couple of months, I think 6% before the end of the year in the 10 year. So I would be short this instrument. And I am, I am long the, the yield contract, which is essentially the same as being short this instrument. Yeah. The micro yield. Yeah. That's, that's an awesome con. Let me ask you this about yesterday. We had a five year, um, looking at my notes here, we had a, we had a, a five-year note auction uh, with a high yield of 4.235 and a decent bid to cover ratio of 2.41. What do you make of that? So that was interesting to me because the five-year was like, is like my, because I'm worried about long duration and I'm not at all worried about short duration. So I don't really know how the five-year fits into that thesis as I looked at it yesterday. So I, I actually think it probably it should be in my longer duration thesis. And then by that measure, I would have been worried about the auction going sloppy. It did not go sloppy. It went better than expected. Although I do think some of these amounts that they're issuing are less than they have historically, just because they've let the, the very short end of the um, duration do a lot of the heavy lifting. So it mattered to me that it went pretty well. But the good news is for me, in order to prove my thesis, I have a seven year today, which is a little more longer term, which is a, should be reflective of what I think, which could be sloppy demand. So, okay, so yeah, the, what's sloppy demand mean? So in, like five months ago, it began. We had a 10-year auction, a 30-year auction, where they had these long tails, meaning everything gets allotted at the tail. And so I believe the first one, like we expected to go 4.81 jumps to mine, and it, we really didn't couldn't sell until 4.86 in the 10-year. And this was back when rates were a little bit higher. So if everything gets allotted at the, the lower end of the bid when, once they collect all the bids and the rate was higher. It need, you needed more, you needed to pay a higher interest rate to compensate the investors. So now you think about a couple of things is that China is now buying a crap ton of gold. They bought the more, more gold than they have their central bank is the bank of China. They used to, you know, buy, be buying tons of treasuries. So foreign demand is starting to dwindle in our instruments, which by the way, that makes some sense. I'm not one of these D dollar guys, but when you have this pattern of where our we are the arbiter of the world's reserve currency, what happened with the Russia thing where we locked them out of SWIFT payment system and we seized all their assets? That's not what good global arbiter, arbiters of reserve currency do. And I think the global market is reflecting that. Now, the dollar is still, for the most part, the only game in town, but just the what level of only game in town, because gold is still out there as well. But anyway, if they don't have the same demand for our treasuries, as they did in the past, rates could go significantly higher. Now, I don't think the Fed's going to let them go ridiculously higher. You know, I said 5%, 6%. I think if they started to go much above that, the Fed would come back in and quantitative tightening, start buying bonds again to support it. Does all that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, so yesterday, I think 81% of the auction was allotted at the high price. Right. So that, that's not slow. Right. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that makes sense to me. That, that's, that was my question. Cause you know, it's really easy to, you know, to uh, interpret these numbers incorrectly. Right? Sure. But so, here's what I always tell people to do is you don't really need to interpret it that much. Just at the time of the auction, it was a five-year essay. You just had the 10 minute chart up a five-year and see how the globe interprets the auction. You know what I mean? All of a sudden five-year, the uh, five-year futures contract started rallying, meaning rates going a little bit lower. So to me, I can say all I want. It's a good auction, it's a bad auction, or, or this, that. But the market said it's a decent auction. That's good enough for me because that's where the money is. Awesome. Uh, well, Jimmy, I, I have my eye on the countdown timer now. I'm getting used to this thing. I appreciate you being here. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? So uh, Twitter, at Jim Uriel, that's J-I-M-I-U-O-R-I-O, and the Futures Edge podcast, which, by the way, thank you so much for plugging it when you have, Jim. The, the response to that has been amazing. You know, we routinely get, you know, thousands and thousands of views 
Uh, and uh, I'm very, very appreciative of all the support of that. So thank you very much. Yeah, again, it's great. I, yeah. We have a half hour and it feels like 10 minutes. And I know we didn't get a lot of things we do. And it's probably because I talked to you that much. And I'm sorry for that. No, no, no. You're awesome, man. Appreciate you being here as usual. All of the symbols, trading ideas, and live trading are for demonstrational purposes and are not recommendations or trading advice. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. All of the information and opinions expressed by third-party guests are their own and are not necessarily those of Ninja Trader LLC. Trading futures involve substantial risk and may not be suitable for everyone, and trading futures can result in losses greater than the initial required margin. Traders should only trade features with risk capital. Risk capital is money that you can afford to lose without jeopardizing your financial security or current lifestyle. You can find additional disclosure information on the Ninja Trader website.